Trenches. Um, I know many of you have been here uh, before. For those of you who haven't, uh, we bring in entrepreneurs who have built and are building uh, really interesting companies and really talk to them about their journeys, how they got to where they are, the experiences uh, that they have uh, learned along uh, the way. Uh, tonight we have uh, a particularly interesting uh, program. We have um, Jeff Margolis. Here, who's currently the chairman and CEO of WellTalk, uh, which is a company that um, you've probably heard something about. They've raised uh, you know, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars. They've been uh, gotten a lot of attention for uh, kind of what it is that they're doing. I think they're one of the most interesting uh, companies in the healthcare IT uh, space today. Um, Jeff has been involved in dozens of financings and transactions, he's run public companies, he's taken uh, companies public, he's been uh, really innovating and leading in the uh, healthcare technology space for 25 or 30 years, so I think it will be a particularly interesting uh, conversation. He happens to be a Chicago uh, native, even though he doesn't live here right now, so I'm sure he's well accustomed to the weather. Uh, and he's been on, uh, I was told, three airplanes already today, and he's flying out uh, right after this. So if he, uh, but he's drinking no coffee, so uh, that's good. I don't think he'll fall asleep, but if so, don't take it personally. Uh, that's what's going on. Um, and our moderator, our moderator tonight is uh, Rishi Shaw, who with uh, Jumpstart Ventures, who many of you have known from Outcome Health, he's invested in uh, many dozens of companies along the way, and an advisor to quite a number of companies and has been moderating these uh, sessions with us for the last uh, three years. He's on the uh, Matter board and has been a great friend of, uh, of Matters. And this is a series that we produced together with him and Jumpstart Ventures along with uh, Paradigm Biosciences. Um, so with that, uh, oh, and sorry, uh, if you have questions to ask, uh, whether you're in the room or on the live stream, go to matter.socialqa.com and Rishi will weave those in uh, towards the uh, tail end of the conversation. So with that, please uh, welcome uh, Rishi and Jeff. Right, well, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we had a comedian here. Um, so, um, you know, look, I got to learn, you know, Jeff, uh, for his most recent company, is, is really a pioneer. Um, but he's been a pioneer all his life, right? Um, and he's done a lot of interesting things. He's written a book that both the Democrat majority leader, the Republican Senate leader, Bill Friss, Tom Daschle, both endorsed. I don't know if I've met anybody that's, that's got that. Um, he's raised over $400 million for his current company, really interesting. He studied computer science in the early 80s at the University of Illinois, which is also fascinating to talk about it. And he's got a whole life for Another good sports team. Right, that's, that's fascinating. So we'll cover all that tonight, and we'll have social Q&A. So please, as you guys are listening, 
um, to Jeff. Uh, uh, note your questions. I'll go to one of you live to save some time for that. Um, but I'll start with this. You're, you're a Chicago boy at heart. You're born here, but you say you grew up as a hick in Colorado. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah I was born on a Gold Coast with a tin spoon in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, a place called Edgewater Hospital, and that's where it's here in um, but, um, yeah, when I was uh, three years old, after a short stint in New York and Washington, D.C., where I absorbed a lot of information, um, at age three, I, I moved into um, Boulder, Colorado. And uh, my house was the third house in the subdivision um, that was surrounded by a barbed wire fence and horses. So, so I grew up. Um, hopping over barbed wire fences with my brother, um, jumping on horses bareback, um, falling into creeks and rivers, climbing trees, and, um, and and I grew up in Boulder in the 70s, the last time marijuana was legal, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So you're out, you're out there in Boulder, which by the way is interesting. You know, we had a, a talk once and somebody else from Boulder, I think you know, said the merchandise market on any given weekend has more people in it than the city of Boulder, right? So, so fascinating to go from Chicago there, but then you came back to Yuma. And you remember dogs are people in Boulder too. Right, dogs are people, they go. Even with that though, I don't know, it's close. Um, and you came back to Yuma, you've had all these interesting experiences in Boulder. You're an entrepreneur at 12, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. Then tell us, you came back to your life, you're studying two really interesting things, business and then computer science, computer engineering, you know, in the early 80s. And, and so that became foundational to you over the course of your career. Tell us about, tell us about the role that played. Yeah, so I'll try to hit the early childhood thing quickly um, as I can. But I'm, I'm the son of a of a patent attorney, an intellectual property attorney. My, the reason we moved to Boulder was my father was an intellectual property attorney for IBM. And it was a college town in a town with the National Bureau of Standards, National Center for Atmospheric Research. And I, I grew up, um, my dad after some time left IBM and I would watch him work with all these brilliant PhDs to incorporate businesses and every single one of them failed. Um, with very few exceptions. And um, <coughs> I sort of sat there and scratched my head and you know, said, if, if these people are so smart, why, why, why aren't their businesses working? I had some very early uh, industrious uh, success. Um, you know, I started illegally driving at 13 and um, a friend of mine. Uh, Wait, you gotta tell us more. So illegally driving at 13. Well, you can't really legally drive. <laughs> but um, um, you know, Boulder was. It wasn't exactly a backwoodsy town, uh, but you know, I was a big kid, I guess. But the um, I, I I found a buddy who uh, had a chainsaw and a shovel, and um, we started uh, we started a landscaping business called Solar Green landscaping and solar green landscaping um, by the time I was 15 or 16 uh, we were grossing probably 60 to 80 grand a summer. Wow. Um, wow. I was able to um, generate Maybe like the 14th biggest business in town yeah, I, you know um, you know it was great and, and, and uh, when I was 16 I started dating this 18 year old who could buy beer um, <laughs> we're still married, by the way. <laughs> this is important. Know your criteria. <laughs> but, the, the, uh, um, but, but I was able, the, the real thing that that got me started on is one, is I learned how to sell. I learned how to kind of put together bids. I understood supply costs, labor costs, timelines, project planning, so on and so forth. By the time I was ready to, to go to college, um, I was, we were able to um, set things up, so I was actually doing internships to learn about things I wanted to do professionally, um, such as um, computer software and uh, computer engineering. And when did you first get exposed to computers? Do you, do you remember that? 
And I'm just trying to think, so like late 70s, early 80s, probably early, early. You're making me feel really old. Man. No, no, no. I mean, well, I remember, I remember this childhood. The National Center for Atmospheric Research was up on a hill in Boulder, and I remember traveling up there on a field trip as a kid, and they had what was called a Cray supercomputer, fastest computer in the world, in moon rock. And the reason it was so fast is they actually cut the lengths of the wires so that the electrical current had the least path to travel. And that, they didn't have, they, they hadn't invented uh, chips yet. Right? They, they, and um, uh, the transistor concept, of course, was a bit known. The University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, um, and and I, I guess uh, then my girlfriend's family, they were, they were both teachers, uh, her parents, and they had an Apple, an app, the first Apple computer, or the Apple II computer. And so, you know, everyone told me I was smart, so I, I tried to learn how to use it and totally got my butt kicked. Um, but uh, I, I, I helped my uh, now mother-in-law write like grocery lists and, and things like that, and I just kind of got used to it. I'll tell you, when I got to college, um, I was able to do some things with that Apple IIe, which earned me some good grades. In an accounting class. In an accounting class, yeah. Ah, to save the suspense. So, so you got to go through this <coughs> early life fast because I'm like 92 years old. Well, you've done a lot. Yeah, I am. At a young age. Um, but the, the um, um, I was in this advanced auditing class at the University of Illinois, and um, I got the Apple IIe to be able to uh, sing the uh, Illini fight song. And I got, a, I got an A in advanced auditing. And I said to this professor, I said, this has nothing to do with auditing. He goes, but it's cool. <laughs> so, um, so, so, but I, but I was always, I was always really interested um, in accounting, record keeping systems, sort of how you organize information, yeah. and that naturally led me to want to understand both business and computers simultaneously. Mostly when I entered college, the use of computing at that time was for scientific purposes; it hadn't been applied to business much at all. Um, and things like office automation, word processing, and so forth. You know, most people were still on IBM Selectric typewriters. Yeah. It's fascinating to think about that period of time and you immersing yourself in computing, but it was a different sort of computing than we think about. No databases, as you mentioned, et cetera, yeah. right? So that, that became a theme, probably, um, that we'll see later. But here you are, you're, you're graduating at 20, right? You're two, two and a half years. Um, you're about to exit. Why did you pick what you picked next? How did you think about that? Tell us about that experience. Right. So, so coming into coming into college, so I had been in high school. I'd been a musician um, and an athlete. I was actually uh, recruited to play here uh, at Northwestern. Um, I was a, a running back, um, all state uh, honorable mention <laughs> in Colorado. Yeah. But but um, but hey, it mattered. It was good enough to get recruited to Northwestern. Um, and uh, I kind of looked at the situation and said, um, you know, I'm probably not going to do anything but hold dummies in the big time. Um, and so instead, I went to the University of Illinois and um, I did the homework for dummies um, on the football team, who would then get me time in the computer lab, big fan guard. It was really nice. <laughs> anyway, a little bit of worker. But so, so when I got there, I was on a dual degree track for computer engineering and uh, business administration. Uh, at that time, the University of Illinois was the top ranked uh, undergrad computer school in the country. Um, and it was the uh, number two rated business school. There were very few accredited undergraduate business schools at the time. So I took this like intense curriculum. I tested out of a whole bunch of stuff, which was really stupid because then I had to compete in these uh, engineering math classes. Somehow I survived through those things. Um, and um, at a semester before I was ready to graduate, I get called in and said, hey, Jeff, great job doing all the work for both degrees. We're going to merge them into one. You're going to be the first graduate in the University of Illinois with the management information system degree. Um, I guess it's cool. I was kind of 
angry. Um, and then, of course, for those of you who have gone to business school subsequently, you know what they did is they, they made it so that the business school kids didn't have to go through the engineering math curriculum. So that made me really mad. But, hey, little character. But you can call yourself an engineer. You say yeah. you might not have been able to. Yeah, well, I don't have a bachelor of science. Um, so you're deciding, you graduated from one, you're deciding between Goldman, IBM, and at the time Anderson, you pick Anderson, it kicks off this whole trajectory. Right. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah, so, you know, at that time, I was trying to, I was trying to think about where, where can you live at the intersection of, of business and computing, and at that point in time, um, Arthur Anderson and Company, which was the dominant um, of the account, what was called big eight accounting firms at the time, um, had begun this management information systems consulting practice. It was just right down the alley where you learn some technology and technology management, and then you specialize in industry. Um, and so uh, I think my wife at the time told me there was no redeeming value that would come out of me going to work at a place like Goldman Sachs. Um, you guys figure that one out. Um, and, and then, um, you know, IBM was very intriguing uh, to me to, be, to become a solutions engineer, uh, but I really didn't, at that time, I didn't see myself being in sales as much as being in solutioning. So, so I let that pass. And, you know, well, we'd love to spend more time on you. You're the youngest manager there. That was, that was fun to kind of talk about. But what I found interesting is you exited that five years later in 1989, went to work as the CIO of an HMO. Yeah. So now another, another kind of pioneering thing, HMOs were not really out there. They were just starting. And you rolled up a bunch of them and kicked off with them at the Trezetto. So tell us about you know, what you thought of an HMO, what, what brought you to that opportunity, what you learned before starting your own company. Right. So today, today, when we think about the healthcare industry, there's a lot of things that preceded the world of today. But back in back in 1980s, early 80s, the predominant form of what what we would call insurance was called indemnity insurance. And so, if you had indemnity insurance, uh, it tended to uh, have a small deductible start at the first dollar. And you know, if you were lucky enough to have insurance, you had insurance, and if you didn't, uh, you didn't. And then um, around that time, some people started thinking, hmm, you know, maybe there's a more systematic way to assemble a supply chain of healthcare resources for humans, for consumers, so that you can have a primary care physician and specialists and labs and diagnostics and so forth and if there was a way to assemble that into a network um, that was there to try to produce the highest uh, quality of care at the lowest cost um, you might actually be able to change the system and of course today managed care is a predominant form uh, of health care uh, in the united states um, but it had a much higher purpose back then so, so the way I thought about it, though, Richie, was um, the partners at the firm, um, I actually helped start the managed care consulting practice at Ben Anderson Consulting. Um, they were kind of like, Jeff, we're, we're not sure if it's a hospital, an insurance company, a bank, sure. a manufacturing company. Go, go figure it out. And uh, I was very lucky to have um, partners in the firm at that time who had a lot of faith in me, and we started figuring it out, and uh, that's created a pretty long run of yeah. me being in healthcare technology. Well, you know, it kicked off something that was pretty special. Um, now I'm talking about Trezetto, the first company you started, um, and things don't happen at this kind of pace often, right? You started in 97, you go public in 99, but you end up staying over, over a decade, well over a decade, Get private over a billion dollars and sell it for a couple billion dollars, and so we're actually not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Volta, but tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Are we here to talk about why am I still working? Right, exactly. <laughs> we're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into that. And, then, and then, and then the spiritual concept we talked about. We're here to do it all. But, but um, you know, tell us about that experience. You know, where were you when that idea came to you? 
What was it like? With my computer engineering background, I can show you how to turn off your phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, tell us a little bit about pulling that team together, pulling maybe the financing together, the customers together, some of the stories from the trenches of that, that journey. So, so, so Trizetto <coughs> was, um, was a really important uh, company um, in 1997. So just to kind of help you guys in the timeline, because I know we've gone really, really fast. I graduated college in 94, um, and then I, um, I'm sorry, in 84. Thank you. Thanks for correcting me. In 1989, um, I left uh, Anderson Consulting, now it's Venture. Um, and then in uh, 1997. So during that time, I had I had been on the uh, bought side of several transactions. A company called Comfort Care, then Pay Care, then FHP International, then Pacific Care. These companies, by the way, can you roll them all up today? Anyone know what it's called? United, United Health Group. Okay, so um, that was a pretty good, pretty good run too. Um, and, and uh, there were a number of different places that came together in fairness to form United Health Group um, from other parts of the country as well. This was more the West, the West Coast base of it. But you know, during that time, I had the privilege of sort of developing a team of people that had um, really been forged in the fires of change and um, change in the industry, massive change in technology. You know, you know, you were mentioning uh, when I was when I was a kid, there was no way to, where to store data. I mean, I just want you guys to understand when um, when I was writing these grocery lists for my mother-in-law, there there were no database management systems. So you could write, you could store a program on a floppy disk, five and a quarter inch floppy disk. But if you if you wanted to put data into it, you had to run the data through it again or you had to figure out how to write a way to actually write and remember data. And, and in, that, in those days, you, if you wrote it, you had to overwrite it. And, and I won't go through all the, the technology of it, but just imagine you know, over a series of years, the five and a quarter, this goes to the three and a half yeah. inch, right? And then uh, suddenly we get hard drives, right? And then, um, the capacity on those drives start to expand. So, but but I can clearly remember, I clearly remember making hundred thousand dollar purchase decisions for disk drives in the data center of our HMO that were like maybe twenty megabytes. <laughs> I mean that's just that's just how much storage was and how much storage cost then. And so. So we had to be very efficient about the programming and the instructions we wrote and the way that we handled data um, as opposed to today, you know, where people write swap you know, because space and data are apparently free. <laughs> Thus speak it to millennials. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're, we're in the Trizetto now. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I love it. it. I love it. And so, you know, what, what was it like that, that first two years, right? Different era. Okay, so, so I, I was kind of lucky because as we, as FHP merged with Pacific Care, um, I made a mutual decision with the CEO of Pacific Care at the time that I was not the right person uh, to lead the IT function there because he wanted a place under the chief financial officer and I was like, no. That's, that's, I've come too far in my career to do that. And so um, the incumbent chief, chief information officer remained there and uh, he did me the best favor anyone could ever do. Um, he said, you know what? Uh, I read all this stuff about best of class mergers, but we're not gonna do it. Every key position is gonna be held by someone at Pacific here today. And I went, so, cause, cause, what I saw then was the opportunity to extract an entire team that knew more about healthcare information technology and the health plan space than anyone else on the planet. And so um, I used my severance package. I wrote some checks. 
I didn't quite have the guts to do it myself. Um, I was, uh, what was I at the time? Uh, <coughs> 21. Um, so uh, found a, a friend who was, uh, I think, maybe 40. And he had a little company. And I said, I tell you what, your company actually has revenue um, and not such a great team. I have a great team and no revenue. Let's put these <laughs> things together. And, and that's pretty much what we did. And, and we formed, uh, formed Trizetto. And uh, Trizetto. One, one of the remarkable things you mentioned is pretty quickly you got 70% share of all the payers. And we see a lot of companies, including some you're by, selling in the payers. <coughs> really on the market now. How, you know, tell us a little bit about how you were able to move so quickly. It was a combination of things. First, first of all, um, it was assembling a team that understood the business of our customers. Um, this is, I know this is being taped, but you might be surprised to learn that there's some very senior executives in health plans and health systems and that actually don't know how their business runs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and they've, they've kind of grown up in that environment. Um, I happen to have a team of people that knew everything that moved, um, billing, enrollment, claim processing, customer service, the underlying technologies, and so on and so forth. Um, what we were able to do is uh, we actually used a consultative model early out so that we could generate revenue rapidly and know that we could make a profit because um, you know, uh, the resources were in demand for people that actually understood uh, how to do computing, office automation, transactional computing, and so forth. Um, Use that and then develop the strategic story. And at that time, the whole idea was to bring multiple software vendors into one data center and to make the data exchange across the industry take place in that center. By the way, the symbol for Trizetto was TZIX, Trizetto Internet Exchange. Um, Al Gore had already invented the internet. <laughs> and and um, what we quickly started doing was, um, once we became public, um, we began to use the currency, the stock currency, to acquire um, other software assets and so we kind of had a 50% organic growth, 50% um, inorganic growth strategy to, to rapidly build up the company. We did the hard work of integrating um, the software and solutions in the background. We invented what today would be called the cloud, um, but we invented um, verticalized computing through a shared resource and to a, a, a data center that um, our customers didn't have to run their own um, data centers and, and computing. And we listen, we just had a really good team. No, no one accomplishes anything by themselves, um, but we just, we just uh, started munching our competition. Uh, the competition we couldn't munch, we bought them. Um, we overpaid, but that seemed to work out. And yeah, and by, uh, so we started that in 1997. By, I think it was 19, uh, I think it was 2003, we celebrated our 100 million life uh, on the platform in terms of. Um, all US. All US. And then um, I think, you know, by the time uh, I finished up there um, as chairman in 2011, uh, I'm pretty sure we had. Um, about uh, 210 million dollars. Wow, that's an incredible story, right? And we'll, we'll get back to it as we talk about some of the, the crunch stuff, but I wanna now move into wall talk. So, you know, here you are, you promised your wife you're gonna retire and, and you're joining these boards and you're getting ready for your chairman life or, or post-chairman life, I should say. And the wall talk founders find you. And you know that leads its own to its own journey, and um, I thought it was a great story. So, you know, get, bring it back to the parking lot. Let's, uh... <laughs> yeah. So, so, so um, very good exits. 
the, the, the way to make money is to you know sell a company, same company multiple times, right? So, so taking so it public, taking it private the first time, and then taking it private a second time, selling it to, to clients. And, and again, a lot of my hats off to a lot of great people, um, including um, you know another CEO that came in after I left, uh, Trizetto, um, and arranged the sale of the cognizant. Um, but so so I had I, I had positioned myself to get onto uh, several boards. I was actually on the board of Crocs, the shoe company, because um, it was in Boulder, and uh, I wanted a reason to see my parents and my in-laws. Um, and it was actually a very cool company, uh, a good experience. Um, but I had sort of grown up. I've been an officer of a public company since I was. Um, I think in my, yeah, 31 years old. And, and so while that, a lot of people find that detestable, um, I think, you know, I did finish my degree in two and a half years, but I went one more semester at Illinois and got my CPA also. So, um, so I'm a CPA, this, that. And, and so I felt like I was, you know, in a good position on healthcare, healthcare strategy, healthcare information technology, and basically fundamentally running companies. So I got myself on four or so boards and a, and a big not-for-profit hospital board. And then- um, You were ready to not be CEO again. I was, <clears throat> yeah, um, CEO. Um, it's a painful job. I, I, I've read, well, guys, you just gotta know there's more CEO jobs available than people that want to sell them in the world. It's just, it's the way it is. Um, I don't know why. Um, not so much here in the Midwest, but um, you know, people have different different aspirations than they, they used to. But um, yeah, so I had I had kept this office uh, in Newport Beach, California, nice little shot of Pacific, um, and um, I was doing Margolis Enterprises things. I'd invested about a hundred companies myself over the years, um, personal family investments, and uh, we have a family foundation in this, um, and. Um, so I was walking, you know, I'm a high glamour guy. I really like hot dogs. Um, pizza. Big pizza fan. Yeah, I mean, I'm in Chicago. I'm so happy to be here right now. Um, I know I have to get right to the airport, but I will be stopping somewhere. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure where yet. I, the, the dilemma's, dilemma corner over there, they had L's, Portillo's, Carson's ribs, and there used to be a Gino's East. That used to be the Right. most difficult for me to make decisions <laughs> in this town. But, but I was walking across this parking lot to a food court uh, one day for lunch and you know, out of the shadows of a minivan pops uh, two guys. Um, one of them is a gentleman that used really to- Really out of the shadows of a minivan? That's, yeah. that's great. Frightening in Newport Beach, <laughs> by the way, high crime area. Um, um, and, and, oh, Jeff, fancy meeting you here. And I'm like, okay, this is not a coincidence. What do you guys want? Because one of them will work for you, right? Yeah. yeah. And so they they explained to me, we have this company, uh, WellTalk. Um, we're creating the Facebook for healthcare. Um, we'd like to talk to you about it. Maybe you could invest. Maybe you could be the chair. Maybe you could. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, I talked to him, I said, you know, I don't really care much for the concept, but maybe if you did this and this. And so about a month later, they had done this and this, and they came back and talked to me, and I'm like. One of those things that I thought would be interesting for this room in particular is, you know, okay, Facebook for health, and maybe consumers pay, right? And you said, well, actually, I think if I recall, B to B to, you know, you had a different way of thinking about that and why that wouldn't work in healthcare. And that might be an interesting. Well, well the first thing I knew is that advertising in healthcare is an investment. You can't, you can't monetize people's personal data. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I still put up this slide, like at the recent JP Morgan conference, I put up these headlines about data and privacy and trouble that Facebook and Google are having. And then I circle the headline, and it says, you know, 2011. Right. Um, yeah. Not today, right? And so people are exceedingly slow uh, understanding the implications of data privacy and security. It, it boggles my mind. 
um, that, that people don't get it. But, but anyhow, what happened is I sort of, I, you've all seen The Wizard of Oz, right? You know, I talked to them two or three times and then I, I sent them off to get me the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West, something mm -hmm. impossible. You know, and they came back and essentially got it done. And I was like, damn. <laughs> now I'm invested. I'm sort of invent I'm invested mentally. Did I mention that the company was um, bankrupt and I have no money, right? All, all, the, things, all the things you would expect uh, to happen. This is the Thanksgiving of 20. 20, yeah, right, this is the summer of 2011, and so, uh, actually, yeah, it, it was actually, when they hit me in the parking lot, it was 2010, and I was still the chairman of Trizetto, so I actually helped them raise an initial round, and, and Trizetto put in a little money, I wrote a check, and so on and so forth, and, and I, I inserted an adult in the CEO slot, um, who also didn't want to be CEO anymore. Um, but um, that kind of went along. The company was making a little bit of progress, but by the time the holidays of 2012 came around, the company was out of money, hadn't really developed a revenue stream. I kind of looked at my wife and I said, gosh, you know, I don't want to lay any of these people off. Uh, I wasn't the CEO yet, really. I was just the chairman. I said, I don't want people to lose their jobs. And so we wrote a check and I got one of the early funders to, to also write a check. And you know, we were gonna let people down after the, the beginning of the year. And um, then what happened is some of the VCs that I had been walking around that founding management team called me very early in the year and said, hey Jeff, come on up to you know, Sand Hill Road, Silicon Valley, and let's talk. And, and um, went into a meeting they said, you're trying to raise four million, uh, we'll give you 12, but you have to run it. And I'm sitting there thinking, my wife, I could just see my wife. <laughs> so I went home and said, I mean? And uh, she goes, you got that look in your eye. And, and uh, I said, well, there's an opportunity here. I, I really think if we do this and 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 this for the company, that th this could, could be something, and you know the guy I just saw me in the parking lot. Talented guys, by the way. Um, you know, the, the, everyone has trouble financing businesses early. Uh, not to take anything away from them, right? But um, so my wife gave. She said, she said, two years, no IPO, hire the right team. And you, she was in. Right here I am. <laughs> you know, you, so you, you might not want to take any advice. Right. Well, I, I don't think that's quite true, but let's, let's look at it, you know, today, right? So it's not Facebook for health. Change the model into a framework that would work for healthcare. How would you describe WellTalk to somebody today? What are the use cases? What are the way people yeah. here might experience the yeah. software? So I'm going to riff off of Trizetto to explain WellTalk. But, but essentially the reason Trizetto was so successful is um, when you heard me describing the advent of managed care, the concept of turning um, primary care physicians, specialists, labs, pharmacy into a network, a supply chain of things that actually formed a product, there had never been any software created to, to essentially assemble the network, price the network, price the product. And so Trizetto became the dominant <coughs> enterprise software, B2B software play for assembling what I call the sick care supply chain. The sick care supply chain, meaning when a doctor or a hospital has to treat you for an illness, okay? And this was very fundamentally important uh, to the creation of HMOs and PPOs and what you guys would know today as you know, sort of opt-out products where you can be in network with some services and go out and network and have different levels of deductibles and co-payments. That was all made possible because software made it possible. Otherwise, you had this disaggregated cacophony of things. Fast forward some number of years, what do we know? We know that 70% of what drives health has nothing to do with quality of medical care or your genetics. Um, we know that people spend well under 1% of their time in a clinical setting. In fact, they spend less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of their time, even a polychronic uh, elderly person and so you go, what is the platform 
that would aggregate all of the direct consumer facing resources that instead of fixing you when you're sick, could help you achieve and sustain your highest call. Well, because Al invented the internet and all that, so that you had zillions of apps popping up, um, um, both offline and online solutions, health, fitness, nutrition, so on and so forth. And uh, kind of took a look at that situation and said, um, how do we, how do we create uh, a personalized network of resources to put around an end of one individual, drawing on all those potential limitless possibilities, and how do you attach that network of things to a benefit product? So today, um, that's what we're doing. We're, we're we're what we call a consumer activation platform, not consumer engagement. Engagement means, engagement's a term that comes out of sort of Twitter metrics, uh, of how much time people spend on time and online. That's not useful in healthcare. What's useful is if you as a consumer or your health plan or your employer or your physician needs you to get something done or wants you to get something done or you want to get something done, does that activity actually get accomplished? So we've invented the consumer action transaction. We've invented the consumer activation platform and we've, we've created the software that assembles uh, all these combinations of implementations. And, and the secret sauce is it's driven off of consumer data through machine learning applied to healthcare as opposed to Claims data, EMR, EHR data. It's highly new data panels. It's now, now, you know, Jeff, pharmacies will use this, right? Payers, life science companies. What's an example of how a <coughs> payer uses this that somebody in this room might, might experience this? Um, you know, I'm going to use an employer. Employer. Um, and then, uh, then I can use a, uh, then I use a payer. So one of our clients is IBM. And IBM is a self funded employer. And they're what you call a multi slice employer, meaning they, their insurance companies include Aetna, Cigna, United, Kaiser, right? They have all of them. But they want to deliver a set of resources to their employee base. So they use our platform to uh, create a common uh, integrated experience across 36 different resources that have been curated by their <coughs> HR and chief medical office, department and chief medical, and then to direct the right resources to the right employee base with incentives um, so that you're getting personalization down to the individual employee and their family level. So that's that's a real life example that we're very proud of. And we also use, um, I should mention, we use IBM Watson um, artificial intelligence to help answer benefit questions uh, as, as part of that platform. So we have a nice partnership with them. Another example would be, um, just imagine a, a Medicare Advantage health plan. So if we all don't know what Medicare Advantage is, um, me Medicare is when you know uh, a person with Medicare coverage can essentially go to any physician or any licensed uh, practitioner, get services and get them reimbursed. Managed Medicare is, think of what the story I was telling you about Tri-Zetalist, where you've assembled a network of physicians and, uh, and, and you're actually, managing the care for a population as opposed to kind of letting people do it on their own. So so in in um, Medicare Advantage, the way those plans get reimbursed is uh, based on knowing what's uh, the risk of their population. And so we have solutions that help people assess the risk of the population using consumer data, not just claims data, electronic health data. data. Um, our solutions help them fix what are called gaps in care. Um, and, you know, what you want to do, right, nobody wants to go into the hospital or have to go to a doctor more often than they have to. So our solutions help push education and programming and social support and things like that to a senior population. So those are two use cases. You know, Jeff, I'm going to switch subjects here. You know, we've raised over $400 million for this company. I know investors have had a big role in it. We could talk a lot about that, but you know, here 
part of our focus is on the early trenches. One of our questions here is, um, if no one knew about Jeff Longolas today, how would you open <coughs> fundraising? So if you were starting something like this and you didn't have you know, your reputation preceding you around it, how would you go about starting this company in 2019? This company or any company? Well, let's just because it's, it's really it's really important. I, 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 I let me answer your question, but I want I just I, I want to give a little wisdom here. Right. When, when you're an entrepreneur, you you have to decide if you're building a product or a company. Okay. Um, most entrepreneurs, I mean, you think they're building a company or building. A company. If you're just building a product, what you want to do is you want to cobble together some friends and family and money. Um, you want to um, get something um, minimally viably built, which does not work in healthcare. Minimum viable does not work in healthcare. But, but you want to get something minimally, and then you want to get a customer or two and, right. and, and, and see if you can generate a revenue stream. More of a consumer process. Right, like a B2C, B, B2C. Um, um, you, you can do that. If, if you're trying to build enterprise software, um, or if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to do something in the healthcare space, you, you just have to understand that, um, you gotta understand the industry you're working in, right? You've got, you know, even a, a tiny hospital on the corner is a billion dollar enterprise. Right. Um, a Medicare Advantage health plan with 50,000 members is a billion dollars. They're blowing more money on IT every month than you can win. Okay, so you gotta, you, you kinda gotta know what you're going up against. But, um, what I, here's the good news. I, I would have told you four or five years ago that venture capital was dead, you know, in a classical sense because um, venture capitalists have really turned into Goldilocks investors. Okay. Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, too, too hard, too soft, just right. You know, they, they essentially were just placing investments in companies that were already proven or, or working and so forth, and that was really tough. Too. I think the good news is, is um, I see more real Series A uh, venture capital happening today. I see more angel investor uh, networks happening today. Really not like the right. Different world. Right. right. Um, I would say concentrate on your idea, your addressable market share, and show show that you've done your homework as to why it's innovative. Um, that's the other thing I see is people confuse innovation and intelligence all the time. I always say the best business lesson I got. I played jazz guitar down at the University of Illinois as well, and uh, on the on the wall of the room where we practiced, uh, it said to be truly innovative, you must first be steeped in tradition. You know, I, I, I can't tell you, I'm a fairly polite person, um, but I can't, I, I gotta tell you, 95% of the people that come to talk to me about a business idea, I've heard it 20 times, and I've seen it fail. And I just, I kind of, Without trying to be That's a good hit rate, I like the people pitching you at Admiral Bloom. <laughs> but 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 I, without being too rude, I just try to kind of ask them. So so why do you think this hasn't been tried, um, or what angle do you have? And sometimes I'm actually able to help them think about how to get out of the fray. Um, but but when someone pitches me an idea, you know their financial projections are wrong. I do look at them just enough to know if they actually know the difference between um, an income statement and cash. Okay, um, you can you can have an income statement that says you're going to produce a profit. That's got nothing to do with whether you'll have enough cash for the business to survive or not. So I, I kind of pay attention to whether people have a plan for cash. Cash, yeah, the name of the game, right? Now I heard from that call, Jeff Margolis, if you're interested in raising money for your startup. Uh, you can make an investment, so I'm, I'm just, just teasing you, but um, we'll, we'll maybe rather fire. I had three fail this month and one win. That was good, that was good. That's positive, right? Yeah, that's good. Um, so, um, 
we'll just maybe rapid fire a few of these because I know you have a lot of interesting thoughts. I want to make sure everybody um, hears a little bit. Here's a question. Um, HMOs, you describe them as having a higher purpose. You know, how do we get back to that higher purpose? Do you still believe in them? That's a very tough 60 second question. I know it is. I don't think it's that hard. Um, you know, as you, as you and I were discussing, um, you know, m my background, uh, I, I guess I was taught uh, that, that there's this concept uh, in Judaism called uh, Tikkun Olam, uh, which is repairing the world. And, and so, you know, I, I kind of grew up with a core set of values that said, um, there's something a lot more important than me. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can leave big buildings and things with your name on it, but what you should really do that might matter is to, to make the world a better place for the next group of people, for the next, for the next generations to come. To me, the, the whole concept of healthcare and managed care is, is um, taking the system from one where we, we treat illness and disease, which is not unimportant, because I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at age 19. I almost died a couple times in my late 20s, which will teach you a lot about the value of other human beings. Um, um, for me, I think probably a blessing uh, that I learned you know, in my 20s that the person mopping the floor of the hospital room was every bit as important as I was. Um, and that was helpful. But, but you, you also have to have the courage to go, this system is screwed up. In fact, it's not a system. You know, we live in a system where, where we almost uh, prolong or maintain chronic diseases because they're more profitable than cure. And, and we, we know that social determinants kind of support system you have around you, your personal relationships, um, your, your education about certain topics are more important to influence your life outcomes uh, than the doctors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and so to me, I'm working, you know, this, back in the day we were trying to produce, when HMO started, a, a higher health status at a lower cost right. around the concept of Care. Sick care, sir. And, yeah. and I'm working now because I don't want to stop until we figure that out right. for health in general. Right. You know, I'm going to switch again here. Um, I found this interesting. You know, what motivates you? Because you talk a lot about you don't, you know, need to be CEO at this point. You almost have thought about that as a board. You know, what makes you get up every morning at 5 15, you go to bed at 11 30, you travel 70% of the time? What makes you do that? No, um, you know, responsibility to others. Um, I, I'm not one of those people, well, I don't want to, there are people in this world who want to make X amount of money, and they say, now I want to devote my time to my family, and this and this, and I've always sort of gone, well, you can do, you can do it all. You can devote time to your family and your community and the business and big things. I call it the abundance theory. The more you do, the more you can do. I think what motivates me now is knowing, I'm, I'm just old enough now that I've watched this pattern where people that make a little or a lot of money who actually know their industry or are the ones in position to make the fix, mm -hmm. they exit before the fix gets done. And then you watch the next generation come in repeat the mistakes, make all, and, and kind of go through this pain cycle. So that, that it motivates me to make sure I can get out there. I'm actually working on a, another book right now um, that, that I'm trying to leave a blueprint for people uh, to express what I know. I'm also motivated by the, the people who work for Well Talk. I care about them, I care about their families. You know, the investors. I, I think we've actually raised 260 of cash, but we've used some stock for some acquisitions as well that gets us to that 400 point. Uh, but I know this is maybe weird, but 
my investors um, who are partners in these venture firms, they're people too. Yeah. I care about them. I care about their reputation. I care about how they do with their partners. Um, and when I'm, when the company's not performing the way I wish it would, I, am ex I feel exceedingly bad yeah. that I'm not putting them in the winner's circle, right? So, so I don't know. I guess what motivates me is responsibility to others. You know, I, I found this interesting talking to you. We didn't get a chance to do a lot of the session, but you know, being a great father, you know, doing a lot of the community stuff you've done, being very honest, those are all very critical to you. Um, how how did you do all that? You, you balance a lot, right? You know, second book, um, the boards. You know, how, how what has been kind of your your lesson? about that, about working relentlessly to build a company, but still doing everything else that you've done? A uh, couple lessons. One is, one is inertia, you know, body and motion remains in motion. <laughs> so, so if, if this whole concept of work-life balance, you know, I find it to be strange, yeah. uh, the way that most people represent it, sort of like, you're at work or you're at rest. Um, that's not natural. That's not systematically uh, natural at all to me. Um, the, the way I think about it is, you know, if you're if you're serving on a finance committee at your church or synagogue or something, right? You 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 take the information and your expertise and you roll into that with some efficiency. And maybe you actually learn something in that not-for-profit setting that then carries into the hospital board that you sit on, and then uh, you learn something about fundraising on that board that you can then take back to the synagogue or church, and, and it just all all builds on itself. Um, you know, I make sure I have um, time to to um, spend with my family. Uh, you know, if you ask him if I prioritize them first, they would answer yes when he needs to. <laughs> um, you have to have a supportive partner. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very uh, fortunate that way. Um, we build our, our goals together. Um, but you know, I would just I would just say the one thing that terrifies me because I've seen it happen. I've never seen anyone stop working their hardest and best and return to their prime form. I've never seen it. So so I'm not saying you have to work hard forever, but I am saying that you gotta be intellectually honest. You're either you're either achieving what you can achieve or you know you're kind of taking a step back. Well thank thank you very much Jeff. We'll leave it here tonight. We so appreciate you coming in to do this. I know you've got to get out soon, but you have a, you have a couple minutes here. Thank you again for being here with us.